Okay, we'll get started. My name is Kristen O'Neill. I am with the New York State Committee on Open Government. I'm the Assistant Director. I've been with the Committee on Open Government for, oh, I think we're, we're about six years now. And uh, I started out as, started out my state career over 20 years ago with what was then the Insurance Department. Um, it's now the Department of Financial Services. And then I moved on to Council's Office with the New York State Office of Mental Health where I served as records access officer. And that's where I, my interest in the freedom of information law started out. Um, and so when the position here at the Committee on Open Government became available, um, I was very happy to move over to the Department of State and, and start here. Up on your screen, you'll see my contact information. That's my direct email address and the phone number for our office along with our website. I, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have, anyone has questions about the freedom of information law, everyone is always welcome to call our office. You don't need to have a government role. You can be a member of the public. You can be a member of the media. You're available to anyone that has questions regarding the New York State Freedom of Information Law and the Open Meetings Law. Uh, if you can't reach me, we have other legal staff in the office that are, are available to answer your questions. So we we'll always call our office and say you have a question about FOIL or the open meeting clock, and we'll get you in touch with somebody who can assist you. The New York State Freedom of Information Law is codified in Public Officers Law Article 6. Well, you don't need to worry about doing any legal research, though, because we have a copy of the statute on our website on opengovernment.ny.gov is where you'll find the Committee on Open Government's website. And we have, we always try to keep as up to date as possible every time there's an amendment, which has been fairly frequently, particularly with relation to the Open Meetings Law in the past year. Um, we've had quite a few amendments to the Open Meetings Law and one or two to the Freedom of Information Law. So when those are amended, we try to get those amendments up and reflected on our website as quickly as possible. Uh, so to the extent possible, the version that you find on our website is the most up-to-date version of the statute. Um, I'll repeat for everybody who um, may not have caught this before I started the recording. Uh, this program will, a recording of this program will be available on our website after um, uh, hopefully sometime by early to mid next week. I'm going to take you through, and I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint for just a moment and stop this. And I just want to take you very quickly through um, what our website looks like. So this is our homepage, the homepage for the Committee on Open Government. Um, at the top of the screen, you'll see some menus. If you hover over the word Freedom of Information Law, you'll see links to the statute, to our regulations, advisory opinions, case law summaries, model rules for agencies. In addition, you'll see a link to the New York State Personal Privacy Protection Law, um, publications relating to open government, and frequently asked questions. Same is true under the heading of Open Meetings Law. We have a copy of the statute, the advisory opinions, et cetera. We have a section for meetings and events. So if you're looking for when the next meeting of the actual Committee on Open Government uh, will be, that'll be under this heading. Uh, events such as this training are under this heading. And any news um, that isn't available sort of on the, uh, in bold on the front page, if you're looking for an older news item, you'll likely find it here under this news setting. And then of course we have our contact page, which has uh, our phone number, the office email address, and our mailing address. If you scroll down a little bit on the page, there's some additional information that you'll come find, and this is where I want to point you right now. Um, because I do ask that 
Um, I always get a series of inquiries after the program, uh, ask, people asking if they can get a copy of the PowerPoint or if the program will be recorded, um, if, they can, if I can send it to them. I, I can't respond to all those inquiries. So just as a reminder to everyone, it's right here. So if you scroll down from the home page, there's a section called I would like to. Click on this button right here, view training materials and recordings. Here are where the PowerPoint presentations will be. And here, if you click on this button, you will find um, previous recordings of my programs. All right, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint now. We already talked, walked you through our website. So now we'll get started about talking about the statute. The original Freedom of Information Law was enacted in 1974. It's fairly limited in scope. It gave access to nine categories of records. Uh, and if you didn't see it on that list, essentially the, the statute did not give you the authority to request those records. You were out of luck. Nobody really loved that version of the statute, so it was repealed and replaced in 1978. And now it's based on a presumption of access. And what does that mean? When a FOIL request is made to a government agency, both the person who's making the request and the agency that is receiving the request should start with the assumption that all government records are subject to FOIL disclosure. Um, I get the question, is this FOILable? Is this a FOILable record or is this a public record? All government agencies should start with the assumption that all government records are public. All government records are available for inspection. And then work your way backwards to determine whether there is a separate statute that affords a confidentiality or whether there is a ground for denial of access under the statute. Who is covered by the Freedom of Information Law? FOIL governs access to agency records. The term agency is defined as any state or municipal department, board, bureau, division, commission, committee, public authority, public corporation, council, office, or other governmental entity performing a governmental or proprietary function for the state or any one or more municipalities thereof, except the judiciary or the state legislature. So what does this mean in sort of common language? Is it, of course, state agencies, anything under the, uh, the, the, the governor's office, anything under the executive, the Department of State, the Department of Health, the Department of Labor, all of those um, executive agencies at the state level are agencies subject to FOIL. The Attorney General's office is the Office of the State Comptroller's office, also government agencies subject to FOIL. Uh, then you sort of move your way down in terms of, uh, of, of levels of government. You have county level government, city, towns, villages, school districts, fire districts, water districts. There are thousands and thousands of units of local government in the state of New York. Um, we have quite a complicated uh, system of government at some point. I was talking to a group of uh, New York State town clerks the other day, and uh, the number 933 was given to me. Just at the town level, there are 933 towns in the state of New York. Um, so that gives you an idea if, if that's just how many towns we have, how many levels of government we have, and how many individual units of government we have across the state of New York. So you'll notice that I said except the judiciary or the state legislature. And what that means is the courts are not subject to FOIL. You can't make a freedom of information law request to the courts for court records. Um, the, that doesn't mean that court records aren't generally available to, to a large extent unless they're sealed. It just means that there's another avenue for obtaining those records and it's not the freedom of information law. And it's not really my area of expertise either. Um, if anyone has questions about access to court records, the first place I recommend people start is with the local court clerk, whether it's town court or the county court or whatever the case may be. I'm sure the court clerks can help you determine whether um, how to access those records and if those records are available. Um, the other entity that is not um, considered an agency under the Freedom of Information Law is the state legislature. Access to state legislature records uh, is fairly limited. It's similar to how the original 1974 version of the Freedom of Information Law, which stated that 
<clears throat> excuse me, that, there, that you could have access to these nine categories of records. The same is true still of the state legislature, uh, that uh, you can have access to certain types of records, but if it's not on that list, uh, you're out of luck. So you're not, the state legislature is not subject to the freedom of information law in the same way. I take a brief break here. I make sure that I'm not getting any, I'm going to look in the chat feature and make sure nope, I'm not getting any concerns raised. So I think everything must be going fairly smoothly. I hope them. <laughs> Every government agency is required by law to designate someone to serve as their record access officer. So what the law says is the governing body or the head of an entity shall be responsible for ensuring compliance with, with the freedom of information law and the associated regulations, and shall designate one or more persons as records access officer by name or by specific job title. Um, the, the agency must also provide a business address and when requests are accepted via email, which should be all the time right now, um, an email address should be provided. And that person, has the duty of coordinating the agency's response to public requests for access to records. This doesn't mean that the records access officer is the only person that has legal responsibility for complying with the freedom of information law. They're just sort of the point person. Um, they're the person to whom all freedom of information law requests should be directed. If you want to make a FOIL request, you need to make it to the records access officer. You can't just send a FOIL request to any government employee. You have to send it to the records access officer. And then the records access officer has the responsibility for coordinating the rest of the agency um, to obtain the records being sought, to review the records, and to determine rights of access. That's, they're the point person. They're the person who coordinates the agency's response. The term record under the Freedom of Information Law is defined very broadly. The term record means any information kept, held, filed, produced, or reproduced by, with, or for an agency in any physical form whatsoever, including but not limited to reports, statements, examinations, memoranda, opinion, folders, files, books, manuals, pamphlets, forms, papers, designs, drawings, maps, photos, letters, microfilms, computer tapes, disks, rules, regulations, or codes. This language is somewhat dated. I'm not sure when the last time any of us have dealt in microfilms or even computer tapes or disks at this point. It's just not uh, as common. But the important thing to remember is that it means any information kept, held, filed, produced or reproduced by, with, or for an agency in any physical form whatsoever. That's the important thing to remember. Um, sometimes I get questions, um, well, uh, I've got copies of, um, of notes or emails, and they're not records that were required to maintain pursuant to a record retention or disposition schedule. And my answer to that is it doesn't matter. Once a record comes into the possession of an, a government agency, it is a record subject to FOIL. When a freedom of information law request is submitted to a government agency, that government agency is not required to create new records in order to respond. Uh, they're not required to answer questions. And they're not required to provide information that does not already exist in record form. The Freedom of Information Law governs access to existing records. There is no obligation to create a new record in order to respond to a request. This doesn't mean that a government agency is not required to make copies of, of existing records or convert existing records into a preferred format if possible. So, for example, if you if a government agency has records in paper format and someone asks for those records to be scanned and emailed to them, if the government agency has that ability, if they have the technical capability of scanning those records and, and emailing them to the applicant, they should do so. There are three exceptions to the rule, to the standard that you're not required uh, to create records. The first is records of votes of how uh, members of a public body vote in an open meeting. 
uh, that it's odd that this requirement is contained in the Freedom of Information Law and not in the Open Meetings Law. And uh, but that's where it is. So every time um, there's a vote in an open meeting or even in an executive session, the law, the Freedom of Information Law requires that there be a record of how each member votes. Uh, the second requirement is every agency is required to maintain a list of the names, public office address, title, and salary um, of all of their government employees and officials. And the third is every agency is required to maintain a reasonably detailed subject matter list. Um, for local government entities, my recommendation is always to adopt the records retention and disposition schedule established by the New York State Archives as their reasonably detailed subject matter list because the LGS-1 put out by the New York State Archives matches up quite nicely with what we would expect a subject matter list would look like. So going back to the idea of creating a new record versus preparing a copy of a record, the agency should keep a few things in mind. An agency shall, by statute, an agency shall provide records on the medium requested by a person if the agency can reasonably make such copy or have such copy made by engaging in outside professional service. Um, again, this might mean converting, uh, if someone asks for something to be scanned and converted to a PDF, if your government agency has a multifunctional copier that allows you to do this, then you should. Uh, if you are have a, a copy of a recording of a meeting and you have the ability to download it and make it into a digital file, that's something a government agency would be required to do. There are a lot of situations um, where if you have the ability to convert an existing record into a preferred format, um, the government agency should do that. In addition, the law says when an agency has the ability to retrieve or extract a record or data maintained in a computer storage system with reasonable effort, it shall be required to do so. Any programming necessary to retrieve a record maintained in a computer storage system and to transfer that record to the medium requested by a person or to allow the transferred record to be read or printed, it shall not be deemed to be the preparation or creation of a new record. This is statutory language. If a government agency has a database and they have the ability to query that database and produce a record that contains the data elements that are being sought, it is required to produce that record, even if it's not a report that is prepared in the normal course of business. Just because it's not a report that you need for your daily life or as a government employee doesn't mean that it's not a record that you would be required to make up to uh, extract from the database in order to respond to a FOIL request. So the person who's making the Freedom of Information has an obligation to reasonably describe the record sought. That's, that's on the applicant. If you receive a Freedom of Information Law request and it's not clear to you as a government, as the government agency, as the records access officer, what is being sought, the first thing you need to do is go back to the applicant and work with them to try to figure it out. Ask for clarification. Um, have a conversation with them if, if necessary in terms of, okay, this is how we maintain our records and um, these are the types of records that we maintain. Um, that sort of interaction should be expected um, when, if there's a Freedom of Information Law request made and it's not clear what's being sought. Uh, the second element of this reasonably describing records um, comes from very old case law at this point. I'm going to ask people to keep their cameras off because when they turn cameras on, um, it, it, it blocks parts of the screen for the people that are viewing. Uh, whether an applicant has reasonably described the record sought the, will depend on how the agency maintains its record sometimes. And can the agency locate or retrieve the record with reasonable effort? And the answer to that will likely be different depending on whether the, papers, the records are in paper or electronic form. 
So for example, if someone makes a freedom of information law request to uh, the town clerk or the town building department, okay, I'm not going to be answering questions during the program. We'll have, uh, we'll have, I'll go through the chat at the end if people want to submit their questions in the chat feature at the end, but just not going to be um, responding to inquiries as we go along. It just it won't allow us to get through. Uh, so I got lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, so, it, so a freedom of information law request is made to a town clerk, a building department, for copies of uh, all building permits issued in 2021. The likelihood is the town is going to be able to respond to that request. It might be voluminous, but the town's going to be able to respond to that request because that's how they maintain the records. They have them perhaps by date or they have them by property address. On the other hand, if someone makes a freedom of information law request for records uh, for all building permits issued for people who wanted to add decks to their homes, um, then the, the town may not be able to do that if they only maintain paper records of those building permit applications. Um, there's not going to be a separate file for, for people who wanted to add decks to their homes. Um, and that agency is not going to be required to go through hundreds or perhaps thousands of building permit applications and review each one of them to determine which ones relate to adding decks to a home. On the other hand, if there's a, an electronic database of these building permit applications, it's very possible that the agency might be able to conduct a search of, of a database and extract the ones that relate to, to, to DEX. Time limits. When an agency receives a freedom of information law request within five business days, they're required to do something. Within that first five business days, an agency is required to either uh, provide access to the record sought, deny access to the record sought, say they don't have the records that are being sought, or acknowledge the request and say they, they need more time. If you, if the agency takes advantage of that last option, acknowledging the request and letting the applicant know they need more time, they're supposed to provide a date in their letter uh, by which they plan to respond that is reasonable under the circumstances. If they require more than 20 business days from the date of the acknowledgement to respond to the request, they're required to provide a date certain, sort of a drop dead date, a date certain that they also must be reasonable under the circumstances, but they also must provide a reason for the delay, a reason why it's taking longer than 20 business days. The agency says we'll respond to you within 20 business days. They're not really, they're not under any obligation to explain to you why it's going to take 20 business days. That's a fairly standard response for any agency of, of any, you know, any agency that deals with a, a good number of FOIL requests. Um, any agency of, of a certain size, responding within 20 business days of, of acknowledgement is going to be fairly standard, and they're not obligated to provide a reason why it's taking them 20 business days. If they are taking longer than 20 business days, they're supposed to give you a reason for the delay, and they're supposed to give you a date certain that's reasonable given the circumstances of the request. If an applicant is denied access to records, they have 30 calendar days to appeal that denial, and the agency has 10 business days to respond to the appeal. If an agency is able, it must accept requests by email. This is a statutory requirement. My feeling is every agency should be able to accept requests by email at this point. Agencies cannot require a requester to use its own form it can require that the request be made in writing. So if you're at, you as a government agency have a FOIL application form, that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with having a form available to the public. But if someone makes a Freedom of Information Law request in writing to the Records Access Officer, either by mail or by email, they've done their job. 
they can't be forced. You can't go, you know, send right back to them and say, fill out this form first. You, you can't place that additional hurdle on them. Once they put their request in writing, they've done all they've required to do in terms of, you know, if they've reasonably described the record sought. Uh, you can, as uh, I say, can require the request be made in writing. Unless there are privacy, personal privacy concerns, an applicant for records should be permitted to remain anonymous. So, for example, if you have uh, a if a government agency has a mechanism for submitting FOIA requests via email, uh, someone could submit a freedom of information law request for, uh, let's say, contracts, government contracts, anonymously. Those are records that have no personal privacy concerns. It doesn't matter who's making the request. It's public to one. It's public to all. The government agency has no right to know who they're sending that record to. It should, they should, the make, person who's making the request should be permitted to remain anonymous. On the other hand, if there are personal privacy concerns relating to the records, if the records, and it, perhaps it's a law enforcement incident report that involves uh, a group of people, and perhaps the record either may be withheld or be redacted unless the subject of the record consents to the disclosure. In those cases, the agency is going to have, uh, likely going to have the right to uh, require identification of the applicant. Oil appeals. There are two situations under the Freedom of Information Law that trigger the right to file an administrative appeal. The one, the first is a typical affirmative or an express denial of access. These are not statutory terms, it's just my shorthand term of describing a situation in which an applicant makes a freedom of information law request and the government agency responds by saying, yes, we have the record that you're looking for, but we're withholding it in whole or in part based on one of these statutory uh, exceptions to access. Um, if that happens, the agency is supposed to give a reason for the, for the denial in writing and tell the person that they have the right to file an administrative appeal and give instructions about how to do that, who that appeal should be directed to. The second situation that gives rise to the right to file an administrative appeal is when an agency fails to respond to a freedom of information law request in a timely manner. And our office refers to that as a constructive denial of access. They haven't actually affirmatively denied, but by failing to respond within the time limit set forth in the statute, they have constructively denied access to the requested records. And this might occur when an applicant submits a FOIL request and there's been no, not even an acknowledgement within five business days. Or maybe the agency did acknowledge the request within five business days and said they would get back to you within 20 business days but that 20 business days have come and gone and there's been no response. In those circumstances, an applicant could treat that failure as a constructive denial and they can file an administrative appeal. If as an applicant for records, you're looking for model language about how to appeal that type of denial, we have model language on our website. It's available via the home page. So there are several grounds for denial under the Freedom of Information Law. And the grounds for denial are, are based on harms that could be caused by disclosure. That's, you know, that was the legislative intent. You know, there was that presumption of access unless some sort of harm would be caused by disclosure. And if you look to the, to the language, you can sort of understand um, why uh, there might be, why a government agency would be permitted to deny access, or even in some circumstances be required to deny access to a particular type of record. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these in great detail, but we're going to talk about some of the more common grounds for denial, and, uh, and we'll give you some examples of, of when those might occur. So as I mentioned here, I'll start. These are the, the first set available on our website. You can pull up, uh, you can pull up this PowerPoint. Um, I did just, I have an older version of the PowerPoint up on right now. I did just ask our, um, my web support um, to post an updated version that's accurate as of today. 
So by, I would say by tomorrow, by the end of the week, um, this version of the PowerPoint will be available on the website. It's not significantly different um, from, uh, from the one that's up there now. I am just noticing a typo, but I won't point it out to you. You guys can catch it on me. Uh, here's some additional grounds for denial. I did not include on the PowerPoint. There's a series of grounds for denial that relate solely to vehicle and traffic law. They come up so rarely that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about them. But they do come up once in a while. And if anyone has you know records that are created um, pursuant to a provision of vehicle and traffic law, they can we can discuss that. So the first ground for denial is the only situation in which an agency is prohibited from disclosing records. All of the other grounds for denial are permissive. An agency, in general, is permitted to withhold records or portions of records, but is not required to. This is the exception to that rule. If a record is exempt by state or federal statute, the agency is generally prohibited from disclosing that other state or federal statute is going to trump the freedom of information law. The government agency is going to be required to comply with that separate statute, not necessarily FOIL. Or it, to the extent that they can be complied with in conjunction with each other, that's wonderful, but the separate statute is always going to trump FOIL if there's inconsistencies. Some examples here are attorney-client communications. Uh, there's sections of the civil, New York State Civil Practice Law and Rules that makes attorney-client communications and attorney work product confidential by state statute. Those should be withheld in response to a FOIL request. If a FOIL request is made to uh, a public, uh, public school district or one of the SUNY or CUNY colleges or universities for student education records, those records are confidential pursuant to federal statute and must always be withheld. Mental health records are, are confidential pursuant to HIPAA privacy regulations and New York State mental hygiene law. Autopsy records are confidential pursuant to New York State county law. County operated 911 records are confidential pursuant to New York State county law. And social security numbers are confidential pursuant to public officers law section 96A. Uh, so if you have a record that contains an individual's uh, social security number, the government agency should always be redacting the social security number. I'm not advocating ever that the entire record should be withheld just because the record has someone's social security number on it, but the, certainly the social security number should always be redacted. So those are situations where it's a, a must withhold. The rest of these are may withholds. Um, the second, is, the second exception to rights of access is unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And some examples here are maybe an employment application of an individual not hired to fill a public employment uh, job. So you have a government agency receives 10 resumes or 10 applications to fill one, one position. Um, the person who gets the job, the person who is hired as a public employee, uh, to a large extent, their, their qualifications, their public employment history, their education, their licensure, that's all going to be public information. The fact that they were hired at all is obviously going to be public information. But the individual is not chosen. The fact that you may have applied for a job and weren't chosen, or the, that should, an agency is permitted to withhold the names and identifying details of the individual's of the people who, uh, uh, who applied for the position and were not chosen. Home telephone numbers and personal cell phone numbers of both public employees and of members of the general public, to the extent that a government agency maintains that information, that information can be withheld on privacy grounds. Medical information maintained by a government agency. And here I'm not talking about medical records maintained by a public health care provider. Certainly that information is another example of information that is a must withhold under, uh, because it's, it's confidential under federal privacy regulations. Here I'm more talking about situations where maybe there's medical information contained in an individual's personnel file or something of that nature. And that's more of a may withhold because the government agency isn't a healthcare provider and it's not subject to HIPAA, but certainly that person 
the, the employee probably has an expectation of privacy with regard to their medical information, um, and if a FOIL request was made for that information, they would likely prefer that the government agency not, with, not disclose, and the agency would be within their rights to withhold that information on, a, uh, on the ground that disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> Um, there's a specific provision relating to public employees' home addresses. So if a freedom of information law request was made to a government agency for their, their employees' home addresses, that could be withheld on personal privacy grounds. Lists of names and addresses of natural persons if that information is going to be used for solicitation or fundraising purposes. And here a common ex an example that I like to use because it's easy and most people have had some experience perhaps with something similar to this is uh, towns and municipal towns um, often issue dog licenses and they have perhaps a, a, a database or a, a file a list that contains the names and addresses, whether it's mailing addresses or email addresses, but names and addresses of the, um, the people to whom a dog license has been issued for their dog. And a FOIL request is made for all those names and addresses. Well, in these situations, a town clerk could respond by saying, I, I need you to certify that you will not use this information for solicitation or fundraising purposes. So if the person who's making the request, for example, owns a mobile dog grooming business and is looking to solicit business for their mobile dog grooming business, the information could be denied to them on the ground that that was their plan. That was what they intended to use the information for. Uh, so either the, the town clerk would require that the applicant certify that they will not be use the information for solicitation or fundraising purposes, and if the applicant refused to complete that certification because they did in fact intend to use that information for solicitation, then the information could be denied on personal privacy grounds. A fairly recent amendment to the open, or excuse me, to the Freedom of Information Law, I, was, I want to say within maybe within the past five years, um, the legislature amended the Freedom of Information Law to include uh, mugshots. Disclosure of mugshots uh, would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. This doesn't necessarily mean that government agencies are prohibited from disclosing mugshots. Oftentimes, there might be a valid law enforcement purpose for disclosing um, a person's mugshot. Maybe, the, maybe the uh, you know law enforcement needs assistance from the public. The, the, it's not a prohibition on disclosing the mugshot. It's just that if a FOIL request is made for the mugshot, the government agency is permitted to, uh, to deny. Something to remember here um, for us public employees, public employees who are listening today, we enjoy a lesser degree of privacy than others. You can find out, you can see through New York and you can find out what my title is, what my salary is. You can find out, you can make a freedom of information law request and find out information about my employment history, about my, you, you can find out that I have a law degree, when I received my law degree, uh, where I got my education from. Those are the types of things that would be available about me as a public employee. Another common ground for denial of access are records that are compiled for law enforcement and where disclosure of those law enforcement records would cause some type of harm. And this is a two-part test, and a government agency has to meet both, both parts of the test in order to deny access. So first, the record has to have been compiled for law enforcement purposes. Um, and this can be either a criminal law enforcement purpose or a civil law enforcement purposes. The courts have held that if a, for example, if a government agency has a civil uh, law enforcement function, if they have compiled records relating to a civil law enforcement investigation, that counts. That is part of, of what this provision of the statute covers. The second part of the test is you need to determine whether disclosure will cause any of the harms envisioned by statute. So would disclosure interfere with a law enforcement investigation or judicial proceeding? Um, this is where I noticed my typo, so I'm going to point you right to it. It says nay and agency instead of any agency. Um, 
a very rec a recent amendment to the statute to the Freedom of Information Law. Uh, actually, the, there have been two amendments. <laughs> First, the FOIL was amended with relation to law enforcement records at the end of 2021. When Governor Hochul signed the bill, she included what's called an approval memo. And the approval memo says, I'm going to sign this bill, but I've already agreed with the legislature that we need to tweak it, that, that I don't think the language is, that I don't agree with the language in whole. So we, I've come to an understanding with the legislature that there will be changes made. And the changes that the governor wanted and that the legislature agreed to were just passed earlier, uh, excuse me, I think at the end of last week, uh, Friday of last week, I want to say, uh, the law was. So what is required now that wasn't required a couple months ago is if an agency, a government agency, wants to deny access to a record on the ground that disclosure would interfere with a law enforcement investigation. And if the government agency that maintains the record is not the government agency that is conducting the investigation, the agency to, who, to which the request was made has to receive confirmation from the law enforcement or investigating agency that is actually conducting the investigation that disclosure of the records will interfere with the investigation. So you, the person, if the government agency that has the records can't just assume or guess that disclosure would interfere with the investigation, they have to receive a confirmation from the law enforcement um, agency that disclosure would interfere. Um, so that's a new requirement. The second harm is that disclosure would deprive a person of a right to a fair trial or impartial adjudication. Uh, the third is identify a confidential source or disclose confidential information relating to a criminal investigation. And here, this is specific to criminal investigations. And the fourth is reveal non-routine criminal investigative techniques. And this is where uh, maybe a government agency uh, has policies or procedures um, where, if disclosed, may allow a <laughs> someone interested in evading law enforcement uh, detection from actually doing so. You don't want to give the, the 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 burglar the combination to the safe. You don't want to give uh, a potential criminal information that would allow them. To, to evade detection, for example. So that's the type of situation that would be covered by that, that last ground for denial. Another ground for denial that is frequently asserted by government agencies is intra-agency and inter-agency material. Intra-agency is information that is all maintained internally within one single agency. Uh, and interagency is uh, communications documents that are shared uh, between or among multiple government agencies. So, for example, an interagency would be perhaps a communication between and among town board members. Interagency material might be a town court emailing me here at the Department of State for advice about the Freedom of Information Law and me responding by providing my opinions about what's required to be done under the Freedom of Information Law request. That's interagency material that an agency is not, in most circumstances, required to disclose in response to a FOIL request. And the intent is to protect an agency's deliberative process. It's, enough, it's to allow a government agency to engage in that deliberative process uh, without, you know, concern that everybody, you know, that the, that the public is going to um, be judging every step along the way, uh, that it, it, if by disclosure of this information, it would inhibit government employees and officials' willingness to engage in robust deliberations uh, in writing, that's the purpose of allowing these types of records to be withheld. An agency is required to disclose interagency and interagency material that contains statistical or factual tabulations for data, instructions to staff that affect the public, 
final agency policies or determinations, and external audits, including audits conducted by the Office of the State Comptroller. Earlier, I talked about situations that give rise to the right to file an administrative appeal. Oftentimes, I see situations where an agency has responded to an applicant by advising the applicant that they do not possess the records that are being requested or that the records that are being requested cannot be located after a diligent search. And the applicant treats that as a denial of access. From our perspective, from a legal perspective, that is not a denial of access. A denial of access is a situation in which the agency has the record but has failed to provide the record or where the agency has failed to comply with time limits under the law. When an agency states that it does not have the record being sought or that the record cannot be found after a diligent search, what the applicant has a right to do is request a certification. Section 89.3a of FOIL states that upon payment of or offer to pay the fee prescribed therefore, the entity, meaning the government agency, shall provide a copy of such record and certify to the correctness of such copy. So that's one situation. If maybe if the person, the applicant wants confirmation that the copy that they received is an accurate reflection of the original, they can request a certification to that effect. Or the agency shall certify that it does not have possession of such record or that such record cannot be found after a diligent search. So if an applicant requests a certification of either nature, an agency is required to provide that certification. It is a statutory obligation on the part of the agency. Uh, the right to appeal when an, when an applicant is denied access to a record or any portion of a record, the applicant has 30 calendar days to file an administrative appeal. The FOIL appeals officer is the head or governing body of an agency, or often more frequently is the person or persons designated by the head or governing body of the agency. Uh, one rule that's established by regulations is that the FOIL appeals officer cannot be the same as the records access officer. So if you have your town clerk serving as, as records access officer, the town clerk cannot also be the FOIL appeals officer. Within 10 business days of receiving a, a FOIL appeal, the appeals officer must either provide the record sought or fully explain the reason for further denials. Or sometimes it's a combination. Maybe the appeals officer agrees with some parts of the original determination, but not all. But in essence, the appeals officer must either provide access to the records so or fully explain the reason why those records are being or continue to be withheld. The law does not contemplate a remand back to the records access officer. It is the responsibility of the appeals officer upon receipt of an appeal to review those records and determine rights of access. Fees. There are two fee structures under the Freedom of Information Law, and those fee structures cannot be combined. The first fee structure is for photocopies up to 9 by 14 inches. A, and a government agency, upon a receipt for copies of records, may charge 25 cents per photocopy for any for copies up to 9 by 14 inches. That's it. End of story. Done. That is the applicant wants photocopies, that's all the agency is permitted to charge, 25 cents per photocopy. The government agency is not permitted to charge for search time or the time it takes to review the records to determine rights of access or the time it takes to make the photocopies. 25 cents per photocopy for copies up to 9 by 14 inches, done, end of story. The second fee structure is for either photocopies that are larger than 9 by 14 inches, or more commonly, it's for records in some other format other than photocopies. Maybe it's a data extraction. Maybe it's uh, scanning records. Maybe it's making a copy of a video or an audio. Those are situations that involve making a copy or a reproduction of records other than photocopies. So the law says the agency is allowed to charge the actual cost of reproduction for all other records. 
when determining the actual cost of reproduction, the law says these are the things you're allowed to consider, and that's it. This is, this is all you're allowed to consider when determining the actual cost of reproduction. Um, and the first thing is you're allowed to, the government agency is allowed to charge the hourly salary of the lowest paid employee capable of preparing a copy of the record but only if it takes at least two hours to prepare that copy. In shorthand, a lot of people will hear that as what I call the two-hour rule. So let's use scanning as an example. Instead of an applicant wanting records, uh, wanting photocopies made, they've asked for those records to be scanned. And the agency has in their possession paper records, maybe it's 50 pieces of paper that they have the ability to scan in a PDF file, attach to an email, and send back to the applicant. No redactions are necessary. They're completely public records, straightforward. It's probably going to take all of five minutes, if that, to run those 50 pieces of paper through the photocopy machine and convert them into a PDF to be sent back to the applicant. In that case, it did not take two hours to prepare a copy of that record. So under the, that example that I just gave, the agency is not going to be permitted to charge a fee. On the other hand, if the agency has, for example, 20 file boxes worth of records that need to be scanned, the likelihood is it is going to take at least 20, excuse me, two hours to scan all of those records. Um, and perhaps you're probably not just going to be able to, you know, email them. Um, you're going to have to maybe put them onto an electronic storage device. So one, you're going to be able to charge the hourly salary of the lowest paid employee that was capable of doing that scanning, um, multiplied by the number of hours it took them to, to, to perform the task. You're going to be able to charge for the cost of the electronic storage device, whether that's a zip drive or, or a CD or or a DVD, something of that nature. Um, if you, if a government agency needs to send something out to a third-party vendor, like for example, maybe they have maps or blueprints or video or audio that they don't have the technological capability of making a copy of in-house, if they need to send it out to a third-party vendor like Staples or Kinko's or something like that, they can do that. Whatever that third-party vendor charges the government agency, the government agency is permitted to pass that fee along to the applicant. Um, government agencies need to keep in mind that they have to let the applicant know up front what those costs were going to be, are going to be before they incur that cost. Government agencies, they're under situations, under the second fee structures, you always, you're required by law to let the applicant know up front what that cost is going to be. My recommendation to government agencies is to always let the applicant know what the cost is going to be, even if it's photocopies. Because if they're not willing to pay it, you don't want to incur a cost on behalf of your government agency that is not going to get reimbursed. I'll always ask up front if they're willing to pay it. Um, if it's a significant fee, for example, if you're going to have to send, if a government agency is going to have to send uh, a record out to a third party vendor, and uh, my recommendation is to get that money up front from the applicant or get a down payment. Um, from the applicant, so you government agents making sure that they're not incurring costs that they're not going to get re, uh, reimbursed for. Again, a reminder to government agencies, you are not permitted to charge for search or review time. You are not permitted to charge for the time it takes you to locate the records. You are not permitted to charge for the time it takes to review the records and determine rights of access. You're not permitted to charge for the time it takes you to sit with a Sharpie. Um, and, and redact records or to use Adobe Pro and redact records, that is not a reimbursable cost under the statute. Um, and so if I, if I can help people understand that the separation of those two things, that you're only allowed to charge for the actual cost of making the copies, um, the, the, all the other costs involved in responding to FOIL requests are not reimbursable. Um, by the applicant. Enforcement. If an agency uh, continues to deny access to a Freedom of Information Law request after an FOIL appeal, or if they fail to respond to a FOIL appeal within 10 business days, 
the applicant's legal remedy is to bring in a civil practice law and rules Article 78 proceeding. And here I'll take, make my little um, PSA announcement. The Committee on Open Government does not have enforcement authority. We often get questions on a very regular basis. Can't you please tell, tell this government agency to do what they're supposed to do? Can't you get these records for me? No, I'm sorry, we do not have that authority. We do not have a statutory enforcement authority. Our role is to educate and to provide advice and legal opinions regarding the freedom of information law and the open meetings law. We do not have statutory enforcement authority. We don't have investigatory authority. We only have the ability to provide, I shouldn't say only because I think it's a big and important job, but we have the authority to provide advice. We educate um, both the government entities, we educate the media, we educate the public on their rights and responsibilities, and then everybody uses those tools and has to, to some extent, advocate for themselves after we educate um, you about your rights and responsibilities. If a petitioner substantially prevails in an Article 78 proceeding, attorney's fees and other reasonable litigation costs can be awarded. It is mandatory on the part of the judge when the requester has substantially prevailed and the court finds that the agency had no reasonable basis for denying access. It is discretionary on the part of the judge when the requester has substantially prevailed and when the agency failed to respond to a request or appeal within the statutory time frame. Again, I will note anyone is welcome to contact our office by phone or by email with questions. This means government employees, members of the public, media representatives, anyone is welcome to call our office or to email our office. In the beginning, I gave you my direct email address, also I'm including our office email address, so anyone within our office can access this account. So if I'm not in, if I'm traveling for work, if I'm on vacation and I'm not available to respond to your email, um, sometimes it's best just to use this email because uh, the person who is most readily available can get back to you with, with an answer. So right now I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint and I'm going to go to our chat feature and see if we have questions. And I'll let people sort of know up front that if I look through your questions and am concerned that perhaps um, the question is very situationally specific, I'm going to ask likely that you contact and, and, and reach out to me, to me in, uh, you know, specifically uh, directly so that we can discuss it, just because I don't want to uh, you know, have go into a very detailed explanation about something that really only relates to one person. So the first question I see here is, can emails and texts be foiled? Um, and I'll go back to, you know, that whole presumption of access. If a government employee or official is communicating in writing, has created information that exists in any physical form whatsoever, and that includes emails and texts. If, if a government agency or, or employee or official is communicating in their role as a government employee or official, those written communications are records subject to rights of access under the Freedom of Information Law. Uh, whether they will need to be disclosed will depend on content, but the communication itself is a record subject to rights of access under the Freedom of Information Law. Next question is, uh, with records access officer as the person who determines who the FOIL request will be circulated to, is there any way to request or check who has actually received, especially if there seems to be parties who should have received but were non-responsive? That's not addressed by the Freedom of Information Law. That's, it's likely not some, you perhaps could make a request for the, for copies of the email communications wherein the records access officer uh, asked uh, the other government agencies and employees to provide responsive records, but there may not be those records. Those communications could have occurred verbally or it's also possible that those communications are going to be withheld as intra-agency material. Um, so to, you know, uh, unless litigation is instigated and that's a whole nother ball of wax, the answer is maybe, maybe not. There's no statutory right to that information. 
member of the public wants a WebEx meeting recording, which has already been live streamed and saved onto Facebook, uploaded to YouTube, must my agency do it? An agency wouldn't be required to upload something to YouTube. It can provide you with a copy of the, of the recording if they have a WebEx, if they have a copy of that WebEx meeting recording, then they can provide the applicant with a copy of the WebEx meeting recording, but they wouldn't be obligated to upload it to YouTube for you. Once they provide it to you, once they provide a copy of the WebEx recording, you're free to do with it as you see fit. If you want to upload it to your own YouTube page, here you can do that, but the agency wouldn't be required to upload it to YouTube for you. Um, what type of records can a workplace safety committee request of an employee for the details of a building? Um, this seems very specific. I'm going to have the person who's asking this question about details of a building and OSHA records. I mean, again, the thing to remember is that all records maintained by a government agency are records subject to rights of access under FOIL. That's the general guidance that I can give. The question, you know, about all of these things, does FOIA apply? FOIL, the Freedom of Information Law, FOIA is a federal statute, just as an FYI to everybody. Um, so the Freedom, FOIA is the Federal Freedom of Information Act. FOIL is the New York State Freedom of Information Law, and that um, is the New York State statute. Um, but the question, does FOIL apply to records relating to a government building? Well, yes, because the Freedom of Information Law governs access to all government records. Whether they need to be disclosed is going to depend on contact. Uh, every year, your city agency nominates up to five. Someone asked me a question that they've already posed to me about it directly, so I'm going to sort of skip over this section if this person wants to reach out to me about nominating youth to a, a uh, for an award, we've already discussed this privately, so I'm going to skip over this. Um, for the clauses that are intended to protect, protect the deliberative process, please confirm that the agency is not required to withhold. Yes, as I said, that the only time an agency is required to withhold is if a record is confidential by statute. And if there is any case law regarding reasonable time limits, there's lots of case law about time limits. You're welcome to look on our website. We have a whole section uh, of case law, um, and there, it's indexed by subject. Are redactions within certain documents considered as grounds for denial? The answer is yes. We wouldn't know or contest whether redactions qualify. There's, when an agency redacts, a record, they're supposed to give you a reason for the redaction. Are you going to know what's under that redaction? No, but you need to sort of make a reasonable determination on your own part as to whether you believe that the ground that they offered you for redacting the record seems reasonable or not. If you have questions, you can reach out to us, but we may not know the answer either. If something is redacted, we have no authority to uh, to review those unredacted records. The Committee on Open Government is not going to be able to review unredacted records. Only a court's going to have the authority to do that. So you just need to make sort of a, a reasonable guesstimate as to whether you believe the ground for denial seems reasonable given the nature of the records. Um, someone goes on, does someone request a list of applicants or candidates from the municipality, and the person goes on to say that the response from the municipality was that the list was verbal. I don't really understand this question about municipalities and lists. If this person would like to reach out to me directly, they're welcome to do that, but unfortunately, I don't really understand the question as it's posed in the chat. Um, 
Must documents supplied in response to a freedom of information law request be provided in consecutive order? No, there's no obligation about how the records are provided. The agency is not obligated to provide them in any sort of particular order as long as they provide all records that are responsive or provide a reason for withholding them. Um, what is the proper response when a document is scanned but part of one side of the document scan is cut off? Sometimes the, the, the answer is always going to be the simplest answer. Go back to the records office, access officer and let them know. Most often it was a mistake. It was just a simple mistake. Just let them know that part of the document was missing. The likelihood is they're going to say, oh, I'm sorry for the mistake. Let me fix that. If they refuse to respond, you can treat it as a denial of access and, and appeal it. But the likelihood is it's, it was just a simple mistake. And you go back to the government, you know, the, the records access officer and ask for it to be corrected. Oftentimes, the simplest answer is, is the right answer. Someone's asking if there's any wording that would allow for the redaction of teacher names on class materials that are being foiled. Um, I can't think of anything off the top um, of my head, but I, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Again, any ground for denial has to be based in one of the permissible grounds for denial. So you have to identify what is the concern with disclosure. Why are you worried about disclosing, disclosing um, the information? Um, if you can identify what that concern is, then you look to the statute to see if any of the permissible grounds for to, to denial matches up with that concern. If not, the likelihood is that the information is going to need to be disclosed. Need to be disclosed. Um, someone asked the question is what happens when the FOIL appeals officer ignores the appeal? Um, you treat it as a constructive appeal denial, and you have the right to bring an Article 78 proceeding in state Supreme Court. If they don't respond within 10 business days, it's a denial of access. Someone said that they recently had to go through more than 3,000 pages of documents to do redactions. It took several hours. Why can't the cost of this be recovered? It is abusive to per permit such requests. Um, well, that's, an, you know, that it's abusive, that's, that's an opinion uh, uh, by, you know, by one person. Um, why can't the cost of this be recovered? Because the law doesn't allow it. If you want changes to the statute, the remedy is to contact your local legislature and um, sort of petition them for changes to the statute. How do you determine what employee files are foilable? All the records maintained by a government agency are subject to the Freedom of Information Law. Whether they need to be disclosed will depend on content. Are there examples of FOIL policies available on your website? We do have model rules for agencies available on our website. If you are if you are a government agency, you are looking to either establish, which I'm hoping you're not looking to establish model rules because the law's been in effect for over 40 years at this point, and your <laughs> government agencies are supposed to have had um, FOIL policies or regulations in effect since the beginning, since the law was passed. Or perhaps you're looking to amend your, your, your FOIL policies. We have model rules on our website. Uh, someone asked if a FOIL request to provide a bid response and the vendor specifically states confidential. Um, it, there's provision of the Freedom of Information Law that relates to uh, an agency is permitted to withhold information which, if disclosed, will cause substantial commercial injury to, uh, to, a, uh, to a commercial entity. So if you receive information in response to, for example, an RFP and the entity, the commercial entity that has submitted that information is asking for either trade secret protection or protection on the ground that disclosure of this information would cause substantial commercial injury. Um, yes, the agency should review and see if they did agree with the commercial entity that the harm would be caused. And if the harm would be caused, that is a, a ground for being able to deny access um, or to at least portions of the report. You need to let them know. You need to let the applicant know that that information has been has been redacted or that those specific pages have been withheld. Um, but, but yes, that is a ground for denial. A question 
this post, can resident information be, can a freedom of information law request um, be made for resident information? Freedom of information law request can be made for anything, for any information maintained in any physical form whatsoever. Uh, the answer is whether that information needs to be disclosed. Based on current case law, the answer is yes. There's, it was an appellate decision in 2017 um, where the town of Greenberg was ordered to disclose a resident email, like a serve, where people signed up, residents had signed up to receive email communications from the town. Uh, the town attempted to deny on personal privacy grounds. Um, they went to an Article 78, went to an appellate decision. The appellate court uh, agreed with the petitioner and that information was required to be disclosed. The appellate court said that the town had not sufficiently justified its reasons for withholding the information. So at this point, the case law is uh, leans in favor of, a, of an applicant being able to obtain that information. The government agency um, wants to be able to withhold that information. They're going to have to provide, meet their burden of proof and withholding. And I guess they're going to need to provide more information to the courts than unfortunately the town, the town of Greenberg did. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, yes, there are sessions recorded and it will be available. And I showed everybody how at the beginning of the program. Um, question, are there any efforts on the way to amend the freedom of information law so there is enforcement other than Article 78? Uh, I'm not aware of any legislation that has seen a lot of interest or action, but that's, that's, those are legislative steps. That's not something that the Committee on Open Government um, is going to have the ability to do that would obviously need to be made through the legislature. Question is, does an attorney need to review every response? The Freedom of Information Law does not require it. Um, if, the question, how do you know when you need to bring it to your attention? I mean, ultimately, if you are the records access officer and you feel like you need legal advice, you reach out to your attorney. That's, that's how you know when to bring it to their attention. Um, we're an agency in the process of drafting a factual report that is not yet complete. Can a draft version of the factual report be exempt pursuant to 87.2G intra-agency material? Um, the likelihood based on existing law is if that report consists of statistical or factual tabulations or data, the information is that the answer is going to be no. It, it, that those aspects of the report are going to need to be disclosed unless another ground for denial can be asserted, such as privacy. Um, if it is a factual report, if it is, contains uh, undisputed factual information or in fact data, that type of thing, that's the type of information that the law requires be disclosed. Um, someone asked a question about record retention, and that is not within our area of expertise. Record retention and disposition is established. Those rules are established by the New York State Archives. Um, our, my email, our email address is on our website. It's our, our contact. There's a contact us page on our website and a copy of this PowerPoint. With all my contact information is available on our website. Um, Someone's asking a very specific question about their very specific FOIL request with the New York City Department of Education, and I'm not able to get into specific FOIL requests on this program, so they can contact that person has already contacted our office directly, and they're welcome to follow up if they still have additional questions. Question is, does copy fee ever change? The 25 cents per photocopy has not changed, I believe, in over 40 years, as far as I'm aware. Um, if that change is going to be made, it's going to be made legislatively. We try to keep everybody aware of any changes to the law, that information, anytime the law is changed, we try to make that information available on our website. But ultimately, if you're a government employee, um, it, it's ultimately the, the government agency's responsibility to make sure that they're keeping abreast of any changes to the statutes.
I'm not going to go over the interagency again. We have lots of advisory opinions on our website. I mean, just generally, someone asked just me to generally go over that again. Um, we have lots of advisory opinions on our website about the interagency, interagency material exception. If you go to, the, to our website, I'm going to pull up. All right. Here I'm on our website, and I'm going to show you that if you go to FOIL Advisory Opinions, and you scroll down, you'll see there's a search function where you can type, like for example, you can type intra-agency. That's one thing you can do. Another thing that might be more productive in this particular situation, because intra-agency is such a broad subject when you're dealing with FOIL, is to go to the alphabetical index. Um, so this is sections E through K. I scroll down a little bit. I, I wish we could have all of the letters here so we didn't have to do that. We said we have groups of letters. I'm just going to do a control F and search for intra there. So we have this. You notice that some of the advisory opinions are black with no hyperlink. I mean, they're pre-1994. Um, we do have copies of them in PDF format. But if you see linkable advisory opinions, I would just start with the linkable advisory opinions because the linkable, linkable ones are newer. They are post-1994. The higher the number, the more recent the advisory opinion. My advice to people is always start with the most recent advisory opinion and then work your way backwards. But if you'll notice, I mean, just the linkable advisory opinions, we have a whole series of advisory opinions on this subject. So that's if you're not really sure what I'm talking about in terms of we have a whole section here. We have a whole series of sort of specific subset advisory opinions, and uh, and you can find them. You can find them here on our website. Sharing back to my someone asked who in local government setting is in charge of searching through elected officials' employees' emails. It's not addressed by the Freedom of Information Law. These are policies and procedures that need to be established by each individual government agency. You need to figure out what the most efficient way of finding the records that are responsive to the request is. Oftentimes, it's just going to the specific employees and say, please search your email. Everyone within a, within a government agency has some responsibility in terms of the Freedom of Information Law because the government agency has a responsibility under the Freedom of Information Law. So this question, there's nothing in the law or the regulations that are going to address this. It's just policies and procedures that need to be established and you figure out what works for you. So person question about how long the deliberative process should be protected. The law doesn't really go into that. It's, Ultimately, uh, you know, an agency may permissively find that even though a, a record consists of deliberative material, maybe there's no harm in disclosure anymore, and they can permissively disclose. But the law doesn't address that. The law doesn't say how long that deliberative process is protected. There's no time limit. Um, when all members of the municipal council belong to only step an open meetings law question, and I'm not going to go into open meetings law questions today. Um, as pertaining to ads and markets law, are we required to let landowner producer the request was about, no, there was a request. I, I'm not familiar with ads and markets law. If there's a provision in ads and markets law that requires you to do that, that's not my area of expertise under FOIL. There's no obligation to let a landowner know about a FOIL request, but I can't speak to ads and markets law. Is there any case law about the right of the public to participate in the deliberative process? No. I mean, not under the Freedom of Information Law. I mean, not relating to the Freedom of Information Law. Um, are FOIL logs, <laughs> are FOIL logs FOILable? Yes. Um, given that agency is allowed to disclose materials that could be will held, who typically, that's, it's not addressed by FOIL. Who, is, who makes those decisions? The records access officer is the point person for FOIL. Who actually gets to decide? It's, it's usually, a, it's oftentimes it's a group decision. Um, you know, you're going to consult with your program people. Maybe you're going to consult with your attorney. 
A contractor requests information to be withheld because it will cause commercial harm, but the information they are requesting to be withheld is private. I don't understand this question about private and essentially illegal terms of agreement. I, I don't understand this question. Someone asked about contract requests in information be withheld because it will cause commercial harm, but the information they are requesting to be withheld is private and essentially a legal term of agreement. It's not, unfortunately, not something I can address right now. If some, this person wants to reach out to me directly, they can. Can appeals officer be the county attorney? The appeals officer can be anyone appointed by the head or governing body of the agency. Um, as long as it's not the records access officer. How does the public verify that the data supplied is exactly what is stored at main time by the New York State Agency supplying the data? Um, I mentioned earlier about the certification. You can request a certification that the copy of the record you received is a true and accurate copy of what is maintained. Not aware of any public subscription to changes in the FOIL law. Um, someone says oftentimes a PDF includes document properties that might include the username or the personal process that generated the PDF. Is there a New York State policy about including or scrubbing such data from the document properties? There's nothing in the New York State Freedom of Information Law that addresses that issue. So we have come to the end of our time here. Um, and I will uh, thank everybody for logging on today. Again, if you have direct questions, you are welcome to reach out to our office directly. A copy of this recording will be posted on our website, as I mentioned at the beginning. Copies of the PowerPoint are available on our website um, from the uh, training materials and recordings uh, link on our homepage. And I thank everybody for joining me today. Hope everybody, hope the sunshine comes out and we all have a great weekend. Thank you very much.